Lord, to this point, we, we have come into contact with merely the fringes of your ways. To sing of your love is to sing of a drop of a bottomless ocean that we have a taste of. To think about our own sin is to really only glimpse what we are able. That is not the bottom of it. We could not calculate the infinite ugliness of our sin in contrast to your infinite beauty and glory and justice and holiness. So to sing about how justice and mercy could meet in the gospel to think about your love for sinners. Words can't describe what it means for you to cross an infinite gap. And surely when we are in glory in your presence, blameless with great joy, we will be in awe that such as us could enjoy such infinite benefit. With these reflections and these lyrics we've just sung on our hearts, we ask now, O God, to to help us as we turn our attention to your word. We need you. We need to think your thoughts after you. We need the help of your Holy Spirit who penned the words that will examine us this morning. We need your Holy Spirit to do his work in us by these words. Help us, O God, to that end. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. I want to give you a little bit of a road map for coming Sunday mornings. Uh, we will be off of our regular scheduled programming, and I want you to know what you can expect from our time in the Word uh, from the next handful of Sundays. I'll be beginning this week a short series in 2 Corinthians. Omri will be preaching next week, but Uh, We'll spend about six Sundays or so looking at a section of 2 Corinthians that provides a radical perspective on life, a perspective, I believe, that we cannot live the Christian life without. I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 4. I've titled this message, Seeing with the Eyes of Heaven. I was wanting to call it, Don't Judge a Book by Its Cover. This sermon's really not about books, it's about people, so don't judge a person by its cover didn't sound quite right. The passage we'll look at is also about trials and afflictions and suffering. We might say, don't judge an affliction by its cover. Appearances can be deceiving. The outward appearance of a thing in this sin-sick world will often lead us to faulty conclusions about reality. And we need a perspective not of this world to get things right. Appearances can be deceiving, particularly if we have grown accustomed to building our perspective on external, visible indicators. What we can see with our physical eyes is what the world can see. But there is far more to reality than what you can see. You remember that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. You remember the scene in 2 Kings 6 when Elisha's servant was terrified at the Aramean armies surrounding Elisha and this servant where they were staying for the night in a little town. Elisha says to his servant, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Who's with them? O Lord, open his eyes. And Elisha's servant was given the privilege of seeing an army of angelic beings on fiery chariots on the mountainside surrounding that puny little Aramean army. And there was things visible to outward human perception, but the reality indeed was far more intriguing. Our physical eyes don't pick up on all that is real. In fact, our physical perception leaves out the most important things. We readily misjudge our afflictions. We easily make wrong assessments about our situations. If we were to truly understand threats and and afflictions and sufferings, if we were to truly understand ourselves and others, we need a recalibration of our perspective on life. We need to see with heaven's eyes. Let's look together at 2 Corinthians 4, and we'll study this morning verses 16 to 18. The Apostle Paul writes here, and you can follow along with me, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed 
day by day. For light, momentary affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, and the things which are not seen are eternal. This morning, we're going to allow this passage to recalibrate our perspective, to reorient our thinking around eternal things and unseen things. And this passage is going to recalibrate our thinking through three contrasts. The first contrast is there in verse 16. It is the contrast between outward decline and inward renewal. Look at what Paul says. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Here on the one hand, our outer man is decaying, yet on the other hand, our inner man is being renewed day by day. That is the first contrast. He begins here by saying, we do not lose heart, and the verse begins with a therefore. That tells us to look up the page, what is going on prior, and this is an inference from what Paul has been saying, really all the way through chapter 4. Look back at chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, therefore, since we have this ministry, As we received mercy, we do not lose heart. They're that same phrase, we don't lose heart. And at the end of the chapter, therefore, don't lose heart. And you noticed in chapter 4, verse 1, there's a therefore there also. And so we have to look back from there, back to chapter 3. And there Paul is describing what it means for him as an apostle to participate in the new covenant ministry. Not the old agreement that God made with his people Israel in the Sinai wilderness through Mosaic law, but this new covenant ministry through the shed blood of Jesus the Christ. What a radical, glorious new covenant this is. And though the old covenant was itself glorious, Moses' own face shone and radiated with the off Uh, off scourings of the glory of God being in God's presence, such that Moses himself had to be veiled, this new covenant is yet even more glorious. And Paul says at the beginning of chapter 4, we have received this ministry, the, the incredible privilege of proclaiming Jesus Christ the Messiah and forgiveness of sin through his blood. We've received this ministry as a mercy from the Lord. That is an undeserved privilege. Not getting what? We do deserve, we get to be proclaimers of this ministry. And that culminates in verse 18 of chapter 3. Paul says, we all with unveiled face, we behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We're being transformed into that same image from one glory to another glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And he highlights the supernatural reality going on in the heart and life of every single believer by the power of the Holy Spirit being conformed progressively into the image of Christ. Paul is putting these things forward to combat the perspectives of the Corinthian believers to whom he's writing. And I want to share with you some of the Corinthian heart that Paul is answering here. They have become consumed with outward appearances. We know this from both of Paul's letters to the Corinthian churches. They considered Paul to be unimpressive in appearance, unimpressive in his presentation. He wasn't as entertaining as the public speakers they liked to listen to. They didn't consider Paul particularly successful. He was always getting beaten up in prison, tortured, and maligned. This is not exactly the existence I want to imitate. Why is that guy the leader? Why should we be following him? This is not a life that tweets out, hashtag blessed. Trouble seems to find him everywhere he goes. He must be doing something wrong. They even suggested that because his life is going so poorly, perhaps he's hiding something shameful. 2 Corinthians as a letter is in large part a defense of the legitimacy of Paul's ministry as an apostle. There were those who claimed to speak for the Lord whose lives seemed quite a bit more livable. There were teachers in the church who impressed the crowds with their finely honed communication techniques. In the Corinthian view, Paul didn't seem to be good at speaking or pleasing to look at or successful in his enterprises. And Paul writes in large part to correct their vision. And he's not defending himself. He's not saying, oh, I am good looking. I can speak good. That's not his defense. Paul, by the way, uh, was very highly educated. It's not that he couldn't speak. But it is that he chose not to use the tricks of rhetoric that were popular in the day to try to 
powerfully induce people to embrace Christ. He believed full-throated that the power was in the gospel itself, in an unadorned proclamation of Jesus Christ. No tricks needed. And so he's defending, really, the truth by defending his apostolic ministry. He's defending the power of the gospel itself over against pragmatism. Paul's defense is a defense of the life-producing truth from God that had been exchanged for gimmicks and crowd-pleasing entertainment techniques. And Paul knows that if the Corinthian believers embraced those things, the church would wither, believers would suffer, and the gospel itself would no longer have a voice and a platform in a world that desperately needed the gospel. We won't, through all, we won't walk through all of Paul's defense. That would take us reading the entirety of 2 Corinthians. But I want to summarize for you the window of it that is here in chapter 4 to get a peek into Paul's heart as a lead up to the section we're looking at this morning. In 4.1, Paul says, we do not lose heart because we receive this ministry as mercy. Paul is addressing the Corinthian believers who are thinking, Paul, you know, Moses was glorious. His face radiated. Shouldn't you be a little bit more impressive if you're bringing in an even more glorious ministry? In, in 4.2, Paul says, I, I'm not operating by hidden shame. He's combating the idea that his personal suffering must be the result of something displeasing to the God that, that nobody can see. In verse 2, he says, I've not operated by craftiness. Uh, in verse 2, he also says, I'm not adulterating the word of God. Not mixing in other things, contaminating it with my own ideas or, or worldly things. Paul says he manifests the truth to every conscience. That is, plain, unadulterated, speaking the truth of God to God's people should be evident to every believer in verse 3, he says, the gospel is veiled to the perishing. And I think you and I feel the tension behind this a little bit sometimes. Why don't people believe? If we really have the truth, if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and we clearly proclaim it, why don't more people just say, aha, yes, thanks for telling me? And Paul explains, because the good news is veiled to the perishing. In fact, he goes on in the next verse, in verse 4, to tell us that Satan himself is active in blinding the minds of unbelievers so they will not believe the truth of the gospel, as glorious as it is. Look, what gimmick, what strategy, what wonderful speaking technique could overcome a judicial veil over hard-hearted eyes and satanic blinding? No human machinations could do that. Only the power of God, which is right where he leads in verse 5. We don't preach ourselves, but we preach Christ. God is the one, verse 6, who brings about supernatural awareness of Christ. Not carnal, fleshly, man-made ministry. What happens? God who said, let light shine out of darkness, is the one who shines in the hearts to give us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. The supernatural work is required, and so that is what Paul is committed to. Forget me trying to be impressive says Paul. Christ is impressive. God's supernatural power is impressive. And so verse 7, he says, we have this treasure, this unbelievable, supernatural, otherworldly, life-altering treasure in earthen vessels. Nothing to look at. Clay pots. Common things. And that by God's design. In verses 8 to 10, he describes affliction, confusion, persecution, forsaking, being struck down, and carrying with him in his body death all the time. In verse 13, Paul describes authentic ministry from God. It was convictional, not pragmatic. We believed, therefore we spoke. It was the truth of God that compelled Paul, who was a slave of God, who could give no other message. This was conviction over the fear of man. Conviction of the truth over pragmatic resources. And then in verse 14, Paul appeals to the resurrection. I'm not living for now. There's a resurrection coming. Don't look at me through worldly glasses. Don't look at me through temporary lenses. Get a different perspective. Don't judge an apostle by his cover, Paul says. And then look at verse 15. You get the heart of Paul here. For all things, Corinthian believers, who are misreading me, misinterpreting me, misunderstanding me over and over again, all things, Corinthian believers, are for your sakes. 
so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. What motivated Paul? Love. Selfless love for the Corinthian believers. All to the glory of God. There aren't many Pauls in the world who could endure such misunderstanding and love so well. Could this afflicted, unimpressive man really be the messenger of God's power and wisdom? That's the Corinthian thought. And the reality in 3.18 is that supernatural work is at stake. The Holy Spirit bringing a saint from one degree of glory to another in a progressive conformity of Christ. That's real success. And yet it's invisible to the worldly eye. It's not seen in the outward man. That's not to say the Christian life doesn't effervesce out in life and words and deeds. But the real supernatural work that is success in ministry is inward, invisible. It's God's work. No human ingenuity or fancy speeches could ever accomplish such things. So don't judge by outward appearances. Don't judge an apostle by its cover. This is why Paul says in 4.17, the verse we're looking at this morning, or verse 16, we do not lose heart. Why do we not lose heart? Because conviction of truth over fear of man, because resurrection hope, because this ministry is a mercy, because supernatural power, all of these things that the Corinthian believers seem to have forgotten were the very things that drove Paul. He's not discouraged. He's not even discouraged. He hasn't lost hope. He hasn't lost heart, even when he's misunderstood by the Corinthian believers. All these things are for their benefit. So this is a setup for this first contrast we need to see. The contrast is one between outward decline and inward renewal. And we might say this, don't judge a Christian by his cover. Look at verse 16. Though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. This is a contrast between the outside man and the inside man. And Paul here doesn't mean a difference between body and soul. He means the whole person as observable from the outside versus the whole person as observable within this is the way Christians look at people versus the way the world looks at people. Who you are viewed either from a temporary viewpoint versus who you are viewed from an eternal perspective, a spiritual perspective. The outer man is human existence determined by worldly temporary circumstances. This inner man is the Christian existence that outlives this temporary world. And it's not merely body and soul, material, immaterial man, because this inner you will be joined materially to a physical body fit for eternity at the resurrection. All of these things are in view in Paul's discussion of the inner man being renewed day by day. And notice the contrast. Outer man is decaying, inner man is being renewed day unto day. The word for decay here is a word used to describe something that spoils or rusts or is moth-eaten. It, it wears out and wastes away. And the contrast in verse 16 is emphatic. Though the outer man is decaying, yet certainly, Paul says, the inner man is being renewed. Just as surely as you feel and experience the decline of your physicality, so surely is God at work in God-wrought life inside. His incessant, continual, relentless transformation by the power of the Holy Spirit. The reality is, Christian, you are more alive each day. The Christian life goes on. So to judge Paul by outward appearances, at times despairing of life in unceasing toil and hardship, broken down, beaten up, abandoned, afflicted, and burdened beyond measure, would be to miss who Paul is, what he's about. To assess Paul by the truth of 416 means that he is more alive than yesterday and will have more vitality tomorrow. Why? Because the outer man is wasting away, the, the freight train decay lumbers down the tracks, it's picking up speed. 
the process of physical decline, the wear and tear of suffering, the sobriety of increasing sadness as life goes on in this sin-sick world. While those physical maladies pile up and the sufferings accumulate and the emotional strain piles on, something else is happening. Invisibly, inwardly, something else is accumulating simultaneously. Real spiritual life, true vitality, spiritual energy, a well of life springing up within Christ in Paul and conformity to Christ in his inner man by the relentless work of the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. The decline of your body from your physical prime, Christian, also marks the rise of what is real life indeed. Every doctor's visit is, of course, one visit closer to home. Every noticeable decline in our appearance and physical ability ought to remind us of the grace of God producing true life within us that physical maladies can't touch, that temporal circumstances can't steal, and that death itself cannot even erase. And this is only true of Christians in whom Christ's life dwells. And we need to understand this contrast. We need to embrace this contrast, get beyond what we can perceive with our physical senses. We need heaven's perspective on our physical lives. Listen to Paul's words in Colossians 3. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. For you have died... And your life is hidden with Christ in God. Did you catch that? Your life. No, I can can see my life. This, This is where I am. No, no, no. Your life, God says, is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ is revealed, that which is your life also will be revealed with him in glory. That's a stunning reality. And it goes against what we see with our eyes. And we need heaven's vision on this. There's a second contrast in this passage, which we need this morning to recalibrate our perspective. And it is a contrast between light afflictions and weighty glory. Look at verse 17. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Paul says, for momentary light affliction. And stop right there. Those words don't go together. Momentary, light, affliction. Affliction is a word that um, carries the, the idea of pressure, unrelenting pressure, a burden, the burden particularly of a consuming hardship. An affliction is that which captivates all of your senses. It seems to dominate your existence, encroaching on all of your thoughts, flavoring all of your experiences. It's what comes to mind when your mind is still. It invades and overwhelms. You can't say momentary affliction. Because when you're in it, it feels like it's all you've ever experienced and it will not let up. You don't call something an affliction that ends in three blinks. And you can't say light affliction. Light affliction? Light, heavy, pressing burden that captivates my mind all the time? This is oxymoronic. Like talking about old news or deafening silence. An original copy, jumbo shrimp, military intelligence, virtual reality. These things don't go together. It's like a math equation that doesn't add up. A featherweight burden, an interminable split second. Let's consider some of Paul's afflictions for a moment. We've already touched in chapter 4 on the way Paul suffered under the condescension and derision of the Corinthian believers whom he loved. And You can turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We could go other places in our New Testament to discover Paul's sufferings, but we'll just stay with the Corinthian letters for a few moments. In 1 Corinthians 4, beginning in verse 9, Paul writes, For 
I think God has exhibited us apostles, last of all, as men condemned to death. We've become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. You're prudent in Christ. We are weak. You're strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty, poorly clothed, roughly treated, homeless. We toil, working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. In 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Paul says simply, I die daily. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. In the opening chapter of this second letter to the Corinthians, Paul recounts in verse 8, For we did not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction that came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we have the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Did Paul really say that? So discouraged that he despaired even of life? Turn to chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4, 8. Paul reports we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, not forsaken. Struck down, not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. 2 Corinthians 6. Verse 4, in everything committing ourselves as slaves of God, in much endurance, afflictions, hardships, distresses, beatings, imprisonments, tumults, labors, sleepness, sleeplessness, hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonor by evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well-known, as dying yet behold we live, as punished yet not put to death, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. And then you have this list in 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. Paul says he experienced far more labors, far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes, three times beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I've spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers and dangers from robbers and dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from such external things, almost like Paul is building this crescendo to what was hardest for him, there is the daily pressure of me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? These afflictions were very real. Significant. They didn't seem to let up. They seemed to characterize his life. They sure don't seem light and momentary. How can Paul refer to affliction as light and momentary given all that he has been through? And the answer is this. It's here in verse 17. By weighing them on the scales of eternity. This is the perspective we need to see. Look at verse 17. Momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. 
and, and you'll have to excuse a little bit of grammar here, there are grammatical parallels in this verse that are striking that are not readily apparent in the English translations. The subject of the verb technically, subject of this verse technically is the word lightness. Lightness. And its opposite is weight. The adjective momentary is grammatically opposite the adjective eternal. And the prepositional phrase of our afflictions in the original is opposite a phrase of glory. And, and the grammatical parallels are almost this picture of scales and things in the balance. Let's, let's weigh one thing over here and another thing over here. And the old-timey scales, you, you put something like produce or some precious metal on one end of the scale, and then you put your pre-measured weights on the other end of the scale, and when they balanced out, you knew how much the thing was you were trying to measure. And Paul here has put lightness over against weight, momentary against eternal, and afflictions against glory. How do they measure out? Paul is encouraging us here to weigh our afflictions, very real afflictions, significant ones, on the scales of eternity. Such that the heaviest burden you've ever known, the kind that breaks the scale of your ability to measure rises on that scale like baby goose downy feather when the weight of eternal glory is placed on the other side. And notice, the lightness of our momentary afflictions is accomplishing the weight of eternal glory. Afflictions are doing something in this verse. They're working out glory for believers. They are producing glory they're accomplishing the building up of weighty glory. <clears throat> and when you see the word glory in the Bible, you, we, we may think first and foremost of the intrinsic glory of God, that which God possesses internal to himself, that if nothing else ever existed, he would still be glorious. And that kind of glory is unique to God alone. And then the Bible describes ascribed glory, give glory to God, to glorify God in your body, etc. That means that we recognize out loud what is intrinsically true of God. It is something like fame, applause. We reflect the fact that God is intrinsically glorious by singing his praises, by rejoicing in him, by worshiping him with our lives. And then the Bible describes shared glory. And you can look at John 17, 1 Peter 5, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 Corinthians 15, to see that God is eager to glorify his saints. The same God who says, I will not share my glory with any other, says, I will share my glory with my adopted children in Christ. Now, God's not giving away his intrinsic glory as if he could separate that from himself. But he brings us into his own glory, the own, his own radiating eminence of the combined total of his attributes. It brings us into the brilliance of his beauty so that we see him and are conformed to him as far as it's possible for finite creatures to resemble the infinitely glorious, beautiful God. What a privilege. And it's interesting here that Paul uses the phrase weight of glory. This is intentional because the Old Testament idea of glory is the Hebrew word kavod, which means heavy or weighty or significant. It's what a surfer says when he approaches a giant swell and he says, dude, that's heavy. It's what we mean when we say someone is throwing their weight around. We're talking about significance. Something's really big and I feel really small. That's the Old Testament idea of glory. And the New Testament idea of glory is doxa, where we get our word doxology, and it is the outshining radiance, the effusion of brilliant and blinding light. And Paul here combines both of those ideas, the Old Testament idea of weighty significance and the New Testament idea of the outshining radiance of the sum total of God's attributes in blinding light into one, one little phrase, weight of glory. To what degree do our afflictions produce for us an eternal weight of glory? How well does this work? Paul answers that question with two prepositional phrases in verse 17. 
Now, the English versions uh, kind of give this at the end, far beyond all comparison, and it sounds like the glory itself is far beyond all comparison, sort of incomparable glory. But grammatically, this is tied to the verb. We should read this, that afflictions are producing, to what degree are they producing it? Far beyond all comparison. What are they producing? An eternal weight of glory. So to what degree are these producing? The, in, the, in the Greek, you have two prepositional phrases, both of which use the word where we get our English word hyperbole. And it's something like this, according to hyperbole unto hyperbole. That is to an excessively exceeding degree. That's how much afflictions are producing an eternal weight of glory for believers. And this isn't exaggeration. Paul, Paul isn't using hyperbole the way we use it in English today. This is just a, an, an incalculable degree. It's, it's all out of measurable proportion. Paul, can you put a number on that? Uh, how much, how effective, how, how productive is this affliction-producing glory? <sighs> Immeasurable. By the way, this is an admission that afflictions are real and burdensome, but they become light and momentary when we view them on the scales of eternity. They're producing something far beyond their ability. Now, an F-15 Eagle has a published thrust-to-weight ratio of 1.04. That means it is able to push more than it weighs, which means it's one of the very few airplanes in the history of flight that could accelerate in the vertical. Just about every other airplane, when you start to pull up, you slow down. An F-15 could speed up straight up, because its thrust-to-weight ratio exceeded 1. Its published ratio is 1.04. By comparison, and that's strong for its size, but the first stage of a Saturn V rocket's thrust-to-weight ratio is 94. 94. And, and to get out of Earth's atmosphere required a lot of power. Maybe another illustration of this uh, strength comparison to to, to size is the strength to weight ratio of an ant. It has been until recently assumed that an ant could lift or drag about a thousand times its own body weight. Uh, normal field ants have been seen carrying dead birds. But some researchers recently wanted to push the envelope on research a little bit. They, they wanted to know at, at what point is, is truly the breaking point of the strength of an ant. And they discovered that the, the, the thing that gives the ant its strength is its neck joint. And the neck joint of a common field ant can withstand 5,000 times its body weight. How did they figure that out? You engineers know destructive testing. Keep putting weight on it till it snaps. I, I'm not endorsing that kind of research. I'm just saying that's how they found out. Our afflictions have a remarkable strength to weight ratio. They work way harder than they should be able to. And of course, this is not of their own doing. This is not of their own intrinsic ability nor of their own desire. Our afflictions don't have it in themselves to bring about inestimable glory for those they afflict. Here comes an affliction into your life. Hey, I, don't want to, I know what I want to do. I want to build up for you more glory, Christian. Can I serve you in that way? Your afflictions aren't asking that question. In fact, this is out of sync with their own intentions. But afflictions are God's instruments in our lives to bring about this infinite good. A good so big, so weighty, so significant, and so enduring that it makes our afflictions themselves seem light and momentary. The commentator R.C.H. Lenski says this, Afflictions are the media used by the efficient hand of God, which thus accomplish what he designs. They are like sharp knives that cut one cord after another that hold us to this earth and its earthly glory. That's true. You think about the way a lever works. A very weak individual with a very long lever can lift lots of weight. So it doesn't matter how many moments these momentary afflictions are. It doesn't matter how burdensome these pressures are. 
they are still only moments. And with the lever of eternity, they are lightweights. The lever of eternal weight of glory causes our afflictions to take on different significance, such that Paul could call them light and momentary. And really, only one who has this comparison can look at his afflictions this way, consider them featherweights, fleeting featherweights, in fact. And when we are in glory, we will surely look back at our afflictions and wonder, that's what weighed me down so much. Appearances can be deceiving. Don't judge an affliction by its cover. This leads to a third contrast we need to see, to understand, to know, to believe by faith in order to recalibrate our perspective. This third contrast is a contrast between what is visible and what is invisible. Visible perception and invisible realities. Look at verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The while we are not looking, uh, literally is just simply us not looking. Us not looking at things seen, but things unseen. Commentators have debated the relationship between verses 17 and 18, between afflictions producing glory and our paying better attention to what's not seen. Scholars have offered a number of explanations of the relationship between these two. Maybe it's afflictions achieve glory because we don't look at what is seen. Or maybe it's afflictions achieve glory on the condition that we don't look at what is seen. It only works if you're thinking about what's not seen. Or perhaps afflictions achieve glory to the degree that we don't look at what is seen. So if you're afflicted, but you lack this eternal perspective, it doesn't count for you. Or maybe afflictions achieve glory while we're not looking at what is seen. Maybe afflictions achieve glory, therefore don't look at what is seen. And some of those explanations have more merit than others. I I have landed at seeing this as a description of the people for whom afflictions produce weighty glory. And I think there are reasons to read it like this. We being people who don't look at what is seen, but what is unseen. In other words, afflictions produce weighty glory for Christians. And Christians are described here as the kind of people who have an eternal perspective. A people who have learned to look not at what is seen, but what is unseen. A people who think beyond this present world. People who are homesick for their true residence. People who long for Christ's returning. People who don't view others according to the flesh anymore. You remember that Paul said, I used to view Christ according to the flesh only. I thought he was just a guy. And no longer. Christians have been transformed, so they are people who don't look at what is seen, but what is unseen. This is something that is true categorically of Christians, and something that also ought to be more true of Christians every day. This perspective ought to define us in greater measure. And then Paul gives this explanation, middle of verse 18, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are unseen are eternal. Why do we set our sights on what we can't see? That's a paradox. Why are we commanded here to look at what's invisible? Because what you can't see is what lasts forever. If you've been trained to fix your gaze on what you can perceive in this life, you are focusing your attention on that which moth will eat, rust will destroy, and thieves will break in and steal. And if they don't succeed, God's going to burn it all up. We have to fix our gaze. Everything we see with our eyes is temporary. As C.S. Lewis said, whatever is not eternal is eternally out of date. That is the perspective we need. We need regularly to be recalibrated by this eternal perspective. 
And I want to think through in our closing moments some implications for our lives in this recalibration, some takeaways. And I trust that this passage will have far more impact on your thinking than what I could suggest in our closing moments. But I want to give you a handful of ways that these truths ought to affect how we think and live. First of all, let's just ask the question, does God give strength now in this moment for all future afflictions? Everything you're going to face. And the answer to that is no. Uh, We know that from the Apostle Paul and the the list of afflictions he endured. He went from one to the next to the next. And he didn't have at the first affliction a storehouse of all the strength that he would need for all the others. Nope, he despaired. he He was discouraged. He was downtrodden. He was perplexed. And he believed God by faith in each of those successive moments. And another affliction came. And God strengthened him. In fact, we read in some of those affliction lists that the very purpose of those afflictions for Paul in those moments was so that he would not trust in himself. I think about the remarkable space between 2 Corinthians 11 and 2 Corinthians 12. Do you live between those two chapters? 2 Corinthians 11 is that list of Paul being shipwrecked and a night and a day in the deep and five times beaten. 39 lashes, stoned and left for dead and in danger from everyone. The burden of the church is on his heart all the time. And 2 Corinthians 12 is the remarkable scene where Paul says, I know a man 15 years ago who got to go to the third heaven. That is not the sky, not space, but the very throne room of God. To be in his presence. And Paul is talking about himself. And he says, I saw things I can't express. I heard things I'm not allowed to tell. I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. You know, it's that speech. He, he can't disclose it. But it was so surpassing in its wonder that it was fuel for Paul to keep going through all those afflictions. In fact, it, it, it so exceeded the sorrows he faced that God gave Paul yet a thorn in his side, another affliction to torment him, to keep him humble. What does that tell us about what Paul saw and experienced in 2 Corinthians 12? I'll do all things for the sake of the elect so that they may obtain eternal life in Christ Jesus. He knew what we are all headed for who are in Christ and any suffering was worth it. And listen, if you only had 2 Corinthians 11, you'd quit. And if you only had 2 Corinthians 12, you'd start taking credit. And and God knew the recipe that the Apostle Paul needed to keep him humble and dependent and faithful, keep going in his ministry. And I think God knows the recipe that you need. Second thought for us as we hear these verses, are we to minimize the sufferings of others? Somebody gets a cancer diagnosis, light and momentary, be on your way. No, no, I think we learn from the Apostle Paul's list of afflictions. These afflictions are real. They're hard. They're not dismissible. They just have to be assessed properly with the infinite lever of an eternal weight of glory. There's a time to weep with those who weep. Real suffering has come and real suffering will be and real suffering will come for all who live on this earth. And there is hope and encouragement in that suffering. The suffering isn't minimized. It just needs to be weighed. Thirdly, notice Paul's own heart shepherding in this passage. It's clear he knows what it is to suffer. And he is shepherding his own perspective by eternal realities. This takes work. It requires mental discipline, energy, faith. It requires us to memorize scripture, to take God's word and hide it in our hearts, to let it flow through our veins, to saturate our heart with those things that tend toward an eternal perspective. Maybe you're here this morning and you recognize you need to cut out some influences that tether you to a visible temporary world around you. That the way you think and the way that you're shaped 
is more affected by things seen than things unseen. A fourth thought. As you age, and it's happening right now, and as you feel the physical effects of the aging process, be encouraged, Christian. Look forward each morning to being more alive every day by the inexorable progress of the Spirit's work in a life yielded to Him. You may be past your physical prime, temporarily, of course. Your physical prime is coming in a glorified resurrection body. But you are increasingly alive in your physical decline here in all the ways that matter. Let your outward decline every day remind you of your inward renewal, that a wellspring of life is bubbling up inside you that cannot be stopped because it is wrought by God. It is eternal life, a present possession, a present possession that transcends your mortality here into your home going and glory. Fifthly, a word to you older Christians. You are more alive. You are more renewed than younger Christians in their physical prime, full of juice, but rookies at inner spiritual renewal. Older Christians, you are more alive today than you've ever been before, and you are still on the ascendancy. There's an encouragement to all of us. Find some older Christians and soak up some of their spiritual vitality. And listen, don't mistake it for hot shot theological answers. But what does a life look like that has been yielded to Christ in simple faith day by day by day by day? Get around those people. Soak in what they have. And you older saints, everyone's looking around to find someone older than himself sitting behind. Is it I, Lord? <laughs> I see you. You need to share your spiritual vitality and your perspective with younger believers. Talk about what it's like to age. Talk about what it's like to grow in Christ and to see him faithful. What is it like in youth? I was, I was talking to a, a man who has lived this out in his earthly ministry this weekend. And he was telling me about walking with younger saints who had jokes about suffering, who hadn't suffered. And being around older saints who have watched friends die and deteriorate and suffer hardships and afflictions. And eventually you grow out of the immaturities of finding hardships humorous into the maturities of a sobriety, even a broken heartedness that comes with living in a God-cursed and sin-broken world. But we need to be around older believers and get perspective. Another thought, and, and just a reminder, I mentioned this earlier, this inner renewal that's a contrast to outer man decay, it is only true of Christians. It's only true of Christians. This is why Paul could say in 2 Corinthians that a believer can view all men and understand what it's like to be dead in sins and alive in Christ. Believers know what it's like to live in the world and be rescued out of it. Believers know everything. You have perspectives on everything. What is the world's perspective? Only carnal, only fleshly, only the visible, only the temporal. They don't get it. They don't understand the Christian life. So number one, Christian, don't be intimidated by that when the world doesn't understand you. Of course they don't understand you. You understand them. And now you have Christ. Don't be ashamed of that. Don't be afraid of that. And if you are not in Christ... And you're here this morning, friend, you need what only Christ can offer. You're going downhill physically, 
And it is appointed for man to die once and then to face judgment. That is, you will meet your maker. And while you have breath and while you have life on this earth, turn to him, the judge of all the earth, who is ready to give you life and forgiveness of all your sins, past, present, and future, if you will but relent. Turn to him in faith. Surrender your life to him. There's nothing you could lose that wouldn't be worth losing. And you have everything to gain in Christ. I think we're on number seven of implications here. You need to remember, Christian, that renewal unto greater life is not threatened by physical demise, by enemies, by sufferings, by persecutions, by sorrow, or by pain. What's real about you, we read it from Colossians 3 earlier, your life is hid with God in Christ. It is safe and untouchable. Your circumstances cannot affect you, the you that God is making from the inside. Number eight, know this, tuck it away. When we reach glory, we will wonder with amazement that we ever considered our afflictions significant at all. I know they're significant now. But take God at his word, trust him by faith. There's a day coming very soon when we'll look back and say, that was heavy. This eternal glory is weighty. And it'll make it light and momentary. That day's coming. And finally, perhaps this text just has to address our hearts this morning about what we value. Do you feel it? I feel it. What's most important to me? This is convicting. Where do you put your hope? Where do you put your trust? What do you invest in? Eternal things, unseen things, or temporary, visible, disposable things? Let's pray. Oh Lord God, thank you for this recalibration. You know we need this. You know we are fleshy. We are mere men. And we are on this earth. We are crowded by perspectives contrary to this reality. And that perspective is so tangible, so visible, though so wrong. Oh God, would you help us to overcome by faith what we see with our eyes, what we feel in our ailing and failing bodies? Would we trust you more? God, give us strength to that by your spirit who is working the work only he can do inside us. These words are wonderful. Let us bank on them with every ounce of our being for the few short breaths we have left on this earth. We ask it in Jesus' name.